Um, so what I'm going to do today, this is, of course, the uh, 200th anniversary of D Charles Darwin's birth and the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species. And so I'm going to kind of um, talk about uh, Darwin and how he used domestication as a model or analogy for evolution in nature and kind of a look back to taking his idea and seeing what we've learned about uh, the genetics of domestication in crop plants and um, you know, how well that conforms to some of uh, Darwin's ideas. So I'm going to start off talking a bit oops, about the um, domestication process and then about Darwin's ideas of using domestication as a model for natural evolution. So that's kind of my introductory remarks. Um, the central part of my talk will be addressing three questions about the genetic basis of domestication. Um, how many genes does it take to control the evolution of a new phenotype? I'm going to focus on morphological phenotypes. Of course, in domestication, there are physiological phenotypes as well, but I'm going to look, uh, consider only morphological phenotypes. Um, what kinds of genes are involved? And what are the nature of the changes in these genes? So I'm going to focus the central part of the talk on those um, uh, questions. And then at the end, I'll come back to Darwin's model and ask is um, what we see in domestication uh, similar to what we have learned by looking at the evolution of natural plant species? And again, with the same idea, changes in morphology during the uh, diversification of natural plant species. So here's another Wikipedia definition, and this is true. This comes right out of Wikipedia. Uh, that's our got a great source of information, apparently. Uh, you know, it's, and you are a sophisticated audience. You know, there's a process by where plants or animals become adapted to the or accustomed to the human-controlled environment through process of artificial selection, and it ranges. There's a whole range of uh, pot uh, possibilities with domestication. There are some crops like uh, oil uh, seed rape, which is only moderately domesticated. It actually can go feral, so you can have feral forms of it, escape back into nature. And kind of at the other end of the extreme would be corn. So corn is entirely dependent on humans for its propagation. If humans went extinct, corn would soon follow. I mean, there may be a few volunteers the next year and a couple more volunteers the year after that, but within a, a few years, there would be no corn on Earth. So it is entirely dependent, it is fully domesticated, and entirely dependent on humans for its propagation. Uh, morphology changes dramatically in, um, in domestication. This is from Steve Tanksley's lab photograph. <clears throat> There's the uh, wild tomato, and here's our cultivated uh, tomato. Of course, the wild one uh, is adapted to be eaten by birds, who then digest the fleshy parts and disperse the seeds. Uh, this one is adapted to be eaten by humans, and we also dis disperse the seeds. We're the seed dispersers. We don't do it exactly the way birds do it, but uh, we essentially, and you can think of that as uh, how domestication works. We are the seed dispersers for crops. So we're not really, in a lot of sense, very different from what goes on in nature. Um, there's also dramatic changes in plant form associated with domestication. So uh, I hope you can see this. It's, uh, this is a wild sunflower growing in uh, eastern Colorado. It's a highly branched plant. Here's cultivated uh, sunflower. It has a single stalk with a large flowering head on top. They're adapted to two different purposes, of course. So here, this uh, highly branched plant with lots of little flowers, it can sort of sense the environment and say, this is a good year. I'm going to branch a lot. I'm going to produce lots of heads and lots of progeny. Or if it's uh, highly shaded or it's not, an, not a very good year, it can produce a smaller plant with uh, fewer heads and that it will mature over a longer period of time. So it may uh, mature some early in the year and then some a little later in the year. The domesticated, of course, one has just one strategy, and it's going to produce a single head, and it's going to produce the seed all to mature at the same time. So this is great for humans because if you're going to harvest that crop, what would you rather do? Would you rather walk through the field and pick all these little tiny heads off that plant, or would you rather just go and pick that one big head off of that plant? And also, the synchronous flowering means you just have to go through the field once and harvest it. You don't have to go back week after week and after week and harvest these as they you know, so, uh, sequentially mature. Just to, you know, you're probably mostly familiar with this. This is an agricultural campus. Of course, the power of our selection is tremendous. These are all cultivated varieties of a single crop, Brassica oleracea. And you've got broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, uh, 
uh, kale, uh, Chinese cabbage, and kohlrabi. It's just tremendous. And these are all selections based on human artificial selection that produced all that diversity. It's absolutely, uh, artificial selection is very powerful. Of course, you could look at nature and see all the diversity out in the world, and you could say natural selection is also very powerful. So domestication, one of the remarkable facts about it is that it started independently in multiple centers around the world and at almost exactly the same time. In fact, the archaeological record is a little bit uncertain, of course, um, and so they probably did, it probably did start at very close to the same period around the world. It started in uh, southern Mexico, it started in South America, it started in Africa, the Middle East, and in Asia. And these were not people who, like one person got the idea and they spread the idea around the world. Independently, in these different centers, people simultaneously, about 10,000 years ago, became farmers, switched from hunters and gatherers to farmers. A lot of other things changed at approximately the same time that you had domesticated plants, you had domesticated animals, switched to a more sedentary life, permanent architecture, and ceramics. They're basically all about the same time. So what was happening back then? Well, there was a dramatic climate change, and this is what's thought to be what's responsible for the sudden switch around the world to, uh, to agriculture. It's not known for sure. But there was a, a dr dramatic warming of the Earth's environment somewhere around 12 to 10,000 years ago, uh, where you can see this uh, average temperature. This, these are data from Greenland, and it just shoots up. The estimates, so one estimate and one article I read on this was that in the space of 40 years, the average temperature rose 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And so with the average temperature rising that quick, the uh, model or the idea that's out there in, in the uh, anthropological world is that the subsistence uh, system that people had at that time, which was largely based on hunting large game mammals, uh, fell apart. The large game were dying out. There was no longer this, their major source of subsistence was gone. They switched to gathering more. As they switched to gathering more, they naturally began to grow the plants and started agriculture because they were under the same pressure around the world, it started independently around the world. There's some uh, ideas about uh, how agriculture may have started. And one way you may think of it, you might think that someone had this great idea. Okay, well, let's just uh, grow plants and we'll breed them and we'll select the best and it will uh, gradually improve them over time and we'll become farmers. So that might, that's one way you might think of it, that they consciously made a decision to become plant breeders and to try to improve the uh, crops that they were, were growing. But another uh, view, and actually probably I would say the most widely accepted view among people working in the domestication field, is that the process was actually much more gradual, was gradual, and that selection early on was probably unconscious. That they did not think of themselves as becoming farmers or did not think of themselves as trying to improve crops or as being plant breeders. Rather, what they may have done is in areas like this where you see here's a, a river and the spring, uh, spring floods would uh, clear away the vegetation on the river plain, creating an open environment. And they would have certain plants that they favored and liked to eat. And they would take the seeds of their favored plants and disperse them into that open environment. Similarly, to increase the stand sizes of their favored plants, they might burn off the natural vegetation and then fill in that area with seeds of plants they like to eat. And so what they would do is they started a sowing and reaping cycle. So they were beginning to sow with the motivation of just increasing this amount of stuff out there they could work with or harvest, but not actually trying to change it. And if you do that, if you plant and then harvest, domestication will ha happen even if you don't mean to domesticate. And here's just one example. If I go through a field, and I start to harvest seeds off of wild grass, which seeds do I get? I get the seeds that are retained on the plant. The wild grass, normally its seeds shatter and fall to the ground, but I won't get those, the ones that shatter and fall to the ground. If a mutant or variant arises in that population that keeps the seed on the plant, those are the ones I'll harvest. And that mutant or allele will rise in frequency over time. So unconsciously, without ever intending to be a farmer, without ever intending to improve the crop, 
you would gradually increase the frequency of the allele contributing to uh, non-shattering, and therefore you would create a crop out of a wild species just by having a sowing and reaping cycle. And the people who've thought through this have pointed out that things like seed size, synchronous, har har uh, synchronous maturity, uh, the sizes of the inflorescence, and the size of the seed, loss of seed uh, dormancy, all of these things will change through an unconscious process without ever intending to become a plant breeder. And that's kind of an important point, because when you get back to making a parallel between domestication and natural evolution, it's important to think that early on it may have been an entirely domestication, entirely unconscious process. So Darwin, of course, is profoundly influenced by domestication. Probably many or most or all of you know, the first chapter of the origins is on variation under domestication. Uh, Darwin called his um, origins an abstract. It's a what, nearly 400 page book, uh, but he calls it an abstract. And uh, his intention was to go back and write it up in full sometime in the future. Uh, he never did do that, but he did go back and he wrote another, one of the chapters is fully expanded, and that's the chapter on variation of uh, plants and animals under domestication. It's a two volume book. It's really, really long. If you ever have insomnia and you need to fall asleep, you know, it's, it's the perfect remedy. Um, I mean, you know, I, as much as I love Darwin, it's hard, you know, it's hard to read, especially because a lot of it's outdated now. Um, and so despite the fact that uh, Darwin was heavily influenced uh, by domestication, of course, when you see a publication of the origin of species, it's also always some colorful animal, toucans or moas or whatnot, or finches on the cover, but never would you see a sheep or a pigeon. Uh, the animals he talks most about on the cover. I did a little word search in uh, the origin, and like pigeon, the word pigeon appears something like 128 times. The word finch, three times. And that's largely to compare them to pigeons. Uh, so, the, so his real interest was in domestication. And in a letter to Asa Gray, the American botanist, he, he has this quote, you know, where he simply says that, uh, you know, it's his interest in domestication that has really shaped his thinking. Uh, I think this idea is probably somewhat uh, controversial among some historians, uh, but Darwin, there's Darwin's own words. So what did Darwin uh, understand? What did he learn from looking at domesticated plants and animals and from talking to horticulturalists and animal breeders? Um, one thing he learned was that heritability rises continually among domesticated species. You know that if you look at a domesticated uh, uh, plant or animal in England, and you knew from historical records that this domesticated animal was brought from somewhere else to England, and yet in England, new variation within that domesticated animal would arise. So he knew there must be new heritable variation arising in domesticated species, because if you went back to where they came from, uh, the variants that the, the, and the types that you see in England didn't exist. And so that new variation must have arisen uh, anew in England. So it taught him that new variation, uh, heritable variation was arising in species of domesticated species. <clears throat> he knew that this, uh, this variation would become the, um, the raw material for the, uh, the work being done by breeders, and that they could use this new variation um, for uh, improving or changing the breeds. Uh, one example he gives is pears. He notes that the pear was brought to England from Italy. Italian pears are just awful. They're not worth eating, he says, but the British pear is really, really tasty. And so there was a case where they could improve the breed with new variation uh, that arose within England, and, and uh, lots of um, uh, examples like that. He talks a, a great bit about dogs, British breeds of dogs. He knows the dog is brought from somewhere else to England, but England has its own series of breeds with their unique characteristics that were created in England by selecting upon this new variation that arose. And that also that these uh, new breeds were not simple single changes that arose all at once, but it was through a process of mo many changes selected over a period of time. And then finally, he says, well, just as that happens with dogs, you can see it in other things like foxes in nature. So here he shows an arctic fox and a red fox. And he says by an analogous process, you could imagine that a, a red fox, uh, that if it geographically spread from its one place into the arctic, there would be new variation arising. 
that which would be selected by nature would become fixed, and you would have a new species of fox appear in, um, in the Arctic region. So this is, uh, you know, what Darwin goes through, or some of the ideas that he goes through in that chapter on variation under domestication. <clears throat> his idea was not well received, or this analogy was not well received. In fact, Wallace, the co-discoverer of uh, evolution by natural selection, uh, even before the publication of The Origin, critiqued it. And Darwin was aware of this, and so he addresses that a critique in The Origin. He, he just says it's wrong. Basically, he says it's a good analogy or a good model. Um, but Wallace uh, did not feel you could use domesticated plants or animals to make any inferences about what happens in nature. And that idea persists to today. There's an article from 1985 where uh, some uh, evolutionists say you can't take evidence from natural or domesticated species and make any inference about nature. Uh, one of the things I often note is that uh, evolutionists will very commonly take artificial selection experiments and make inferences from that, which they'll apply to evolution if it gives the result they want, um, but from domesticated species, no. And uh, I have a colleague who works on corn evolution, and last year she emailed me a review of an article she wrote on corn evolution, and she said, what should I do? The uh, reviewer said, I'm not allowed to use the word evolution when I talk about corn. I can only use the word domestication. And so I told her you should just tell them that humans are the seed dispersers for corn, just the way as uh, birds are the seed dispersers. But I've had that same thing happen to me in reviews, uh, where I'm told I should not use the word evolution because domestication is not evolution. <clears throat> so what is it they object? What, do you, what are some of the objections to using domestication or thinking about domestication as evolution? And one is that crops are some sort of monstrosities, they're dependent on humans, and so they're not comparable to natural species. But you know, natural species are dependent upon each other. I'll just take this example, it's an amelanchor, it's a kind of fruit that has its seeds all locked up in this berry. It would not be able to sustain itself except for the birds that disperse it. So it is dependent, and if I were a pine, which has naked seeds that fall right to the ground, to me, an amelanchor with its seeds in this berry would look like a monstrosity, right? Because it would not be able to freely disperse its seeds. It's reliant on those birds. So I don't think the crops which rely on humans as seed dispersers are any more of a monstrosity than any other organism that relies on another organism for seed dispersal. You'll sometimes read that artificial selection is much stronger than natural selection, but you never see the data. You know, so I don't know why people say that, but I don't know where the data are. Uh, domestication only involves disabling or loss of natural adaptation. I certainly don't think that's true. We see um, uh, <coughs> uh, cases in um, domestication now where we have gain-of-function mutations that are creating new uh, things that uh, are different from the wild species. And then also, sometimes natural evolution also involves disabling or loss of function. This is a parasitic plant, orthobanchi. And um, it has completely lost its photosynthetic capability being conducting photosynthesis by deleting the genes involved in photosynthesis. That's probably made it a better parasite. You delete the genes for photosynthesis, you become a better parasite. So I don't think that, one, domestication necessarily is always loss of adaptation. It's adaptation to a new environment, the human-controlled environment. And that um, even loss can be part of, loss of a, a function be, cre uh, be a way of adapting to a new situation. And then the idea, too, is that humans, uh, artificial selection is conscious, and so that's fundamentally different from natural selection. But as I pointed out already, that it's thought that early domestication was probably largely unconscious. In fact, anthropological interviews with native peoples, when they asked them, what are you trying to do with your crop, their, their response would be, I'm not trying to change it. I just want the same as my ancestors before me had. So they're not actually trying to change it. The change may be coincidental. Uh, it may happen through a more natural process, if you will, uh, than, um, uh, than through any sort of deliberate attempt during domestication to actually improve things. So from my perspective, domestication would fit very comfortably into kind of the range of things that one would see uh, in terms of evolution in nature. So Dar of course, this is a controversial analogy. Even in Darwin's time, Wallace didn't like the idea. And Darwin does something very interesting in his chapter. He kind of introduces it, and then he kind of slips away from it. 
It's kind of interesting. So he introduces con conscious or methodical selection. So, you know, and this is where the breeder has the distinct objective of creating a new breed. Okay? Um, and he talks about uh, fan-tailed pigeons. So you're breeding fan-tailed pigeons, and you're actually trying to get a bigger fan-tail. So you see an individual with a very large tail, and you select that one for breeding. So this would be a case where the, the conscious or methodical selection Darwin sees as uh, what breeders do in part. Darwin also talks about unconscious selection. It's, this is actually a little different from the kind of unconscious selection I was talking about before. But he says that uh, just simply keeping the best individuals without any intention to change the breed will nevertheless over time improve the breed. And he gives some examples with sheep where two uh, sheep uh, breeders who working from the same parental stock actually produce two very different looking breeds, although if you interview them over a relatively short number of years, if you ask them, they were not intending to do that. They got distinct results, but it was all unconscious. And then finally, he goes one last step, and he says that um, natural selection continues, uh, uh, contributes to diversity of domesticates. And he just gives the example, he's take, uh, you know, like farm animals, wherever they are, they are also being selected by natural forces. If they are moved into an environment that's a, a colder environment than where their uh, parental stock came from, those that are best adapted to the colder environment will more likely survive and continue to the next generation. And that over time, you'll get distinct breeds in distinct parts of the world due to this natural selection acting upon uh, uh, domesticated animals. And um, so Darwin is really unrepentant in the face of Wallace's criticism. Uh, he stuck to his guns. But what I think he's doing as he goes through here, he's trying to remove the designer. So and I think that, you know, because the idea he was up against was creationism, where you had someone who designed species. And so he has to say, well, we can use it as analogy. But in fact, you don't need a designer or creator. That nature alone can do it, even on our create new breeds by this uh, process of natural selection. So why should we um, study uh, uh, crops and, uh, as an interesting example of evolution? I think there are uh, some really good reasons to make crops an excellent uh, study topic for uh, evolutionary biologists. Um, one is they really experience major changes in adaptation and major changes in morphology. Uh, this is the plant I work on. It probably doesn't show up too well, but this is the tiny little ear of teosinte, the enormous ear of maize. The difference in morphology is so extreme. When they were first uh, found uh, teosinte growing in the wild, they had no idea it was related to maize. They actually thought it was closer to, to uh, rice. And it took them about 100 years to figure out that teosinte, which looks nothing like maize, is actually very closely related to maize. So there are wonderful um, morphological adaptations to domestication to be studied. Um, these changes were recent. And so what that means is that the wild form, the progenitor, and the domesticated form remain cross-compatible. So you can do genetics. In many of the interesting adaptations that occur in nature, the ancestry of the species is so ancient that you can no longer do make uh, genetic crosses. And the genetics have become much more complicated over that very long period of time, where uh, wild ancestors and crops are members of the same biological species and typically freely interfertile. And then, um, again, the, the domestication took place about 10,000 years ago or less. And so yeah, that's the same point I've already made, that they're, they remain cross-compatible so we can do genetics. So let me then <clears throat> go through the middle part of my talk, is what we've learned uh, from studying the genetic architecture of changes in morphology during the domestication process. And I'll start by talking about the number of genes it takes to create a change in form. So there have been a lot of work done in this area. And I'll just give you some examples. So in many cases, we find sing simple single gene inheritance. This is a wonderful case uh, of switching from uh, what's the typical of the wild barley, which is you have uh, a single fertile spikelet making one grain, and it ha has um, two sterile spikelets on either side. So a single mutation, a recessive mutation, creates what we have as more common phenotype in domesticated barley, which is the two lateral spikelets are restored to fertility. So you're taking an organ that was sterile and bringing it back to fertility. And um, 
So the, uh, and this is controlled by a single gene. Of course, you, here where you had just one grain, now you have three. So you have a, a uh, inflorescence that has many more grains in it and therefore more useful to uh, the people who are growing it. The wild one is maybe better adapted to seed dispersal. You want to disperse your seeds one at a time rather than multiples at a time. And, um, and so having, uh, and then all of the sterile spikelets on the side may actually aid in dispersal and also in catching wind to help d uh, drill the seed into the ground. This is an example from wheat. <clears throat> it is uh, called the Q gene. It's not, um, uh, it has an important change in the morphology of the wheat plant. And so the wild wheats have a very long, more sl slender spike. And the uh, cultivated forms that have a special allele of the Q gene have a more dense spike where the spikelets are, are more tightly packed together. But more important, in the wild form, all the chafe is staying att attached to the uh, seed, whereas in the cultivated form, they're what's called th uh, free threshing. So the grain separates easily from all the chafe. So again, a single gene is responsible for this change. <clears throat> And then here's an example from rice, again, another simple uh, 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 single gene inherited trait. And so what we see is that in wild rice, the uh, plant has two phases of growth. It has an early phase of growth where it spreads out along the ground, and then after some time it begins to grow uh, erect. But the domesticated rice grows erect from the beginning. So right out of the ground it grows erect. And so this has, um, uh, nice advantages when you can plant densely and for harvesting. And there's a single, a single gene that controls uh, this trait. Now, many traits that have changed during domestication are controlled by multiple genes. This is uh, corn and teosinte, the wild ancestor of maize, shown here on the left. It's a very branched plant. Domesticated corn is typically unbranched like this uh, with a single ear. We did QTL mapping. This is from my lab. Uh, we found minimally 13 genes that are affecting this, but we did find among those 13 there was one of really large effect. So it's not as if there are 13 equal players, but rather there's one big player and then a series of small players. Uh, the gene action was mostly additive, so it's not like it was a dominant or recessive. Um, and what is going on here is you're gaining a function which is to repress the outgrowth of the lateral branches. So it's actually a gain of function in this case. So what, um, uh, in that, how we would do that then is we would, in this case, we would take uh, corn and teosinte, we would cross them. This is the F2 population. We would see a whole range of F2s, some of them like corn with short branches, some like teosinte with these very long branches, intermediate forms in our F2 population. We get something that's coming pretty close to a normal distribution when you measure how long are the branches. Uh, we can map the QTL. We find them essentially on all the chromosomes. I think we would find even more if we had more statistical power. But among those, as I mentioned, we have one very large one, which is here on chromosome one. And how large is that large effect? Well, if you just ask what's the effect of this region of the genome, it'll make, change the branch from the maize form of about 35 centimeters long to about 65 centimeters long with the teosinte homozygous for the teosinte portion of that chromosome. So this is one genomic region, and we now know now from a lot of work that's one gene, uh, one genomic region that adds a foot to the length of the branch. So that's a pretty big effect. In tomato, it's a very similar story. Multiple genes affecting tomato fruit size, but in his review of his work, Taxi, he says they found minimally 28, and depends on how you do the counting, maybe 51 genes. Um, but there were six genes of very large effect. Among those, there were six big players. Importantly, he notes that size does not equal yield. So they're not selecting for yield. They're getting bigger tomatoes. But when you get a big tomato, what happens is you get fewer tomatoes per plant. So you're getting an uh, increase in harvestability. Would you rather walk through the field and collect uh, you know, a couple hundred tiny little berry-sized tomatoes or go through and just collect a few dozen of these very large tomatoes? Much easier to do the other. They, um, these uh, tomatoes, uh, or these genes involved, affect multiple different types of developmental processes. Some of them affect the number of chambers within the fruit, what botanists call locules. Uh, sometimes they can multiply uh, wildly, so you get these tomatoes with just an enormous number of little locules in the fruit. They can ch 
change cell size and, and cell division rates and so forth. So a lot of different developmental processes are under selection to produce that large fruit of tomato. Uh, Tanksley's group also looked at tomato shape. So of course, we, the wild one is a nice spherical little berry. Uh, our typical cultivated tomato is not quite round, but you also have these elongated forms, these more egg-shaped forms, these kind of uh, eggplant-shaped forms. So there are a lot of different shapes. And again, they found multiple genes, but there were three genes that had very distinct and large effects, essentially like single major genes. But within the background of all this other variation, they are inherited more quantitatively. In, corn, in kernel size in corn, uh, we've found minimally 10 genes, but we found one of relatively large effect to go from the small kernel of teosinte, large kernel of maize. And corn, its wild ancestor, has a covering on the seed that's missing in um, cultivated maize. Minimally 10 genes, but there's one gene that shows up in all our QTL mapping experiments with a or QTL with a consistently large effect. So this is, you know, I point out, well, we have single gene inheritance, then we have this case of multiple genes, but some with large effects. And then finally, you can get cases where, where you get multiple genes, but none of particularly large effects. So the work in sunflower uh, for the number of inflorescences on the plant, again, it's, there's an issue of statistical power. They found nine genes, but all of them had small or moderate effects. None of them showed a particularly large effect in terms of explaining the amount of difference between the uh, parental or the wild and cultivated species. And similarly for a fruit case weight uh, or fruit weight in the sunflower, minimally 10 genes, they'd probably find more if they had more statistical power, uh, and all are of small or moderate effect. No clear big players. So this is the other end of the extreme. So what I did, you know, in preparing this lecture, I looked at 49 studies of inheritance in 18 crops for multiple traits, and we get an insight. And the first rule is that there are no rules. And that is you can have any form of inheritance. You can have single gene inheritance, you can have multigenic inheritance with a big player, or you can have cases where you can't find any gene, a particularly large effect, but find multiple genes. Um, it may be that if we had, a, a, you know, a complete catalog of everything going on there, we could reach some generality about if one or more of the others of these modes is more common, but clearly anything can happen. There's some issues with the design and execution of the QTL study, but a number of the, enough, a large enough sample of these genes have now been cloned that we can be fairly confident that the major QTL are real. And they are, in fact, big players. And we can certainly believe that there are going to be uh, many more smaller effect QTL out there. So now what are the kinds of genes involved? So I think uh, the people working on crop domestication have been phenomenally successful in this area. Uh, we now have a, a, a pretty good, a, a growing catalog of cases where they've taken a gene involved in domestication or improvement of a crop and isolated it by, typically by positional cloning. Uh, and I'll give you one example to start uh, from my lab. This was where we had this QTL of large effect for plant architecture on long arm of chromosome one. It has this normal distribution, but if you look under the normal distribution, you can see that individuals that carry homozygous teosinte uh, or homozygous maize tend to have towards this end of the distribution with short branches. Individuals with homozygous teosinte uh, tend towards the other end of the distribution with large branches. And so you can get this trait to mendelize in an isogenic background and thereby uh, uh, go ahead and, and positionally clone the gene underneath. So we've done this uh, in, in this case, and we cloned the gene, the, the major gene involved in uh, branch habit or uh, plant architecture in maize. Turned out it's called the Teosinte branch gene. It's a transcriptional regulator. Um, if you knock the gene out in, here's Teosinte, very branched, here's maize. If you knock the gene out in maize, you get back a Teosinte-like phenotype. So what's happening is that this gene, which, uh, is present in teosinte was, in a sense, uh, turned on or upregulated at a higher level to uh, repress the outgrowth of the branch. Now, if you knock the gene out, you get back this very teosinte-like phenotype. It's expressed in the axillary buds, where it's acting on branch outgrowth. And, um, and so that's uh, one example of uh, what humans have selected for. And we went ahead and studied it in a little bit of molecular detail. We could see that the, in, if you look at isogenic lines for the maize and teosinte allele, 
These are old northern blots, but they make the point. Here's the teosinte allele is expressed at a much lower level, about half the level of the maize allele. We know that that difference is due to a difference in an enhancer that's about 70 kb upstream from the site, upstream from the open reading frame, so that um, the maize allele uh, is expressed at a higher level than the teosinte allele uh, due to a change in this cis regulatory factor. Here's another example from my lab. This is a case of this covering on the uh, ear, uh, on the kernels. Teosinte has this covering. In maize, the covering is, la is lacking, so the kernels are uh, naked on the outside of the cob. Uh, we mapped 10 QTL for that, but one of large effect. We were able to clone that by positional cloning. It turned out to be another DNA binding transcription factor. Um, it is uh, uh, another plant-specific group of transcription factors. And what we found is there's only one difference between maize and teosinte in this gene, and that's a single amino acid change. And the single amino acid change is what's responsible for the difference in phenotype. And basically what's happening is, uh, this is not all published yet, but that single amino acid change turns this protein into a repressor of its target genes. So that it's turning down its target genes rather than turning them up. And the result is that the fruit case or covering that it's supposed to direct the development of is stunted so that the covering doesn't develop fully and you get a naked kernel. So here's a wonderful example from rice. Um, shattering trait in rice, uh, wild rice has a seed that shatter from the inflorescence, cultivated rice, the seeds stay attached. You know, it's like the same story over again uh, as ours. They found a major QTL on the long arm of chromosome one. It had a very large LOD score. So they positionally cloned it. It turned out to be a DNA binding transcription factor. Uh, in this case of a Bell one like homeobox uh, member. And then, this is a really beautiful case. Here's the open reading frame. 10 KB upstream from the open reading frame, there's a single nucleotide difference between wild and cultivated rice. Okay. So that single nucleotide difference is in a binding site for um, an abscisic acid uh, insensitive gene known from Arabidopsis which is another transcription factor. So you've got this like, cascade of transcription factors. And so the binding site for one transcription factor has been obliterated for the abscisic acid insensitive transcription factor is obliterated in the non-shattering by the change from a G to a T. When you do that, the band of expression in the abscission layer of the uh, gene is gone. And with the gene no longer expressed in the abscission layer, the abscission layer doesn't develop, and the seed stays attached to the plant. So there's, again, a case of a single nucleotide change causing the change in phenotype. Um, here's another case from wheat. This is the Q gene from wheat, positionally cloned, another DNA binding transcription factor. Um, this one I really like. Uh, these are the wild wheats with their long slender spikes, the more compact, compact wheats. In this gene is a microRNA binding site. Uh, MIR-172 target binding site, there's a single nucleotide change in that micro... And it's such that the nucleotide change in the cultivated one would disrupt the normal binding site, and what happens in the cultivated one, the expression of the gene goes way up. So, of course, the microRNA would typically regulate, downregulate the gene, change, alter the binding sites, the microRNA doesn't bind there anymore, gene uh, expression goes up, and I think that's probably what the causal change is. Uh, but they also found that there was uh, some additional change uh, in a single amino acid difference between the wild and cultivated alleles, and this uh, amino acid change affects homodimer formation. So they've got two potential biochemical reasons for why the phenotype might change. Uh, I like the microRNA tar binding site uh, hypothesis better than the uh, uh, homodimer formation hypothesis. Uh, here's another case, grain number in cultivated rice. Same thing, they mapped the number of QTL. They went after to clone the big one. In this case, it's a gene involved in hormone degradation. The hormone cytokinin is involved in, in making lots of spikelets within the uh, inflorescence. And so if you degrade the enzyme, the, or degrade the hormone, then it stops doing that. But if you knock out the gene that degrades the hormone, the hormone hangs around and you make more and more and more spikelets. 
So here's the wild with relatively few spikelets in the inflorescence. Here is the cultivated with many more spikelets. And the result is due to a early stop codon, uh, basically a loss of function in the uh, uh, gene controlling this uh, uh, hormone uh, uh, degradation enzyme. Uh, from fruit weight and tomato, so this is a, a good QTL cloned by Steve Taxley's lab. And what here is there's a shift in the timing of gene expression. So Taxley's group calls this a heterochronic shift in gene expression. In the wild allele, gene expression starts relatively late and then gradually goes up. But the cultivated allele, gene expression goes up much earlier. So gene expression is on early and then goes, goes, gets turned off later during fruit development. The gene seems to function as a repressor of uh, increase in fruit size. So by having it expressed early, um, it's not repressing fruit growth later in development. And so therefore, you can get a larger fruit. So to sum up, what have we seen for the kinds of genes involved? So I find 13 cases where we have uh, genes have been, you know, for me, unquestionably cloned, clear data uh, that are uh, involved in changing form uh, during the uh, domestication process or right after domestication to improve the crop. 10 of the 13 are transcription factors. Uh, that represents 77% of the cases. Now, transcription factors make up about 5% of plant genomes. So if you're impressed by things like chi-square tests, you can do one. You'll get a very small p-value. And that'll tell you that uh, this is many more than expected in terms of the proportion that are transcription factors. Um, one is a cell signaling gene. One's involved in hormone metabolism. And one, we really don't know um, what the uh, function of the gene is. So there are some questions. You know, I'm, I'm des deciding that uh, I'm talking only about changes in morphology or form. Maybe if I included physiology, transcription factors wouldn't be as quite a big, a fact, a big a, uh, proportion. But actually, a lot of the physiological changes are also controlled by the transcription factors um, uh, regulating the pathways. <clears throat> OK. So then. Um, the last thing, the question I wanted to address was, you know, what types of changes are taking place in these genes? So we can broadly define that as regulatory changes, and I mean cis-regulatory changes. So those would be indicated by these little blue symbols, or you've got some piece of information here, a binding site for DNA transcription factor, uh, and uh, that will affect the level of expression of the gene. Or then you could have a protein function change, uh, such that you would alter what the protein is doing, change in the amino acid. So what, among the cases that I've listed, uh, this is how they break down. Of those 13, five are cis-regulatory. There's no question about it. The data are just purely cis-regulatory. Two are quite clearly protein function changes. There are three cases in which there is evidence both for a protein function change and for cis-regulatory changes. And then there are three other cases where it's just the loss of function. In one case, the entire gene is deleted out. So the gene, 17 KB of sequence is gone, and the gene is gone. And so there's a range of this impossibilities here. Uh, there's not a lot, enough in any one group to say this group, this type of change is dominant over another. Um, and so I would say we, you know, we would probably need a larger sample to make uh, some statement about uh, the, if one of these types of changes is more common than the other. But there's clearly many are happening. So for the 13 cloned genes, I would say at this point there are no rules, and we just need a larger sample of uh, domesticated genes. So now I want to switch and say, <clears throat> does what, what if we looked at natural species now? Would we see an entirely different story? Because things that happen in domestication are unrelated to what happens in nature. It's not a good model. Or does Darwin get it right? Is, well, if we looked at natural species, would we see something very similar? So you can find lots of cases, not, or not lots, at least several, where people have looked at inheritance of traits in natural species and found simple uh, single gene inheritance. This is one very beautiful case. It's the nectar spur in Aquilegia. It's a recently and rapidly diverged group of plants. They have a very near relative that lacks the nectar spur, and it's essentially inherited like a single gene. Uh, this is Les Gottlieb's work here from uh, UC Davis. Um, <clears throat> the presence or absence of the ray flowers in the genus Leia. 
Um, so there's a species called Discoides that has uh, 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 beautiful ray flowers, and then glandulosa, which lacks these ray flowers, unless with a, a very painstaking and careful work, multiple crosses, back crosses, uh, also, you know, every way he could think of doing it, clearly defined two gene system involved in, the, in regulating this trait. In our work, in our own lab, we looked at the presence of leaf hairs in teos, two different types of wild teosinte. One of them completely lacks it, and one of them has dense leaf hairs all over the leaf sheet. Okay? I should back up a second and say, so we can see multiple cases where we see um, single gene inheritance. Here's a case where we see a multiple QTL, um, but one with a very large effect. So for the presence or absence of leaf hairs, we found one very large effect QTL, and we found it in three different QTL experiments. It wasn't some sort of artifact of a single experiment. Every time we did this experiment, this large effect QTL showed up in exactly the same place. And it explains about 50% of the difference between the species. So it's a very large effect QTL. A similar work has been done in Mimulus for Corolla width, with QTL counting for 68% of the difference in Corolla width between species. Uh, this is one I like. It's a Macroceros. Typically, flowering plants have four anther uh, sacs in each anther. As you see here, that's the classic. But there's a, a, speci a, of, a species of Microceros that has only two anther sacs. So they found a one major recessive QTL plus four modifiers, uh, essentially, again, a case where you have a big player and several little players. And now here's the other end of the extreme. So this is Corolla with an, another Mimula species. And this is very carefully done work uh, by uh, John Willis's lab. Uh, 15 QTL were found, all of small or moderate effect. None of them accounting for, uh, most all of them accounting for less than 10% of the species difference. None of them accounting for greater than 15% species difference. So with natural species, we see the same range of types of inheritance that we see with crops. Nothing really very different. So the data I've looked here, 20 uh, studies involving 17 species pair with multiple traits per study in some cases. And I come up with the same rule. There are no rules. That uh, the modes of inheritance are quite variable. And you can do it with single genes. You can do it with a big gene plus multiple QTL. Or you can do it with lots of little genes. I think an issue with the, with the natural species is many of them, the time scale is much greater than with domestication. So some of those species may be diverged for 500,000 years or more in which case the genetics may have become more complicated over that intervening period than they were initially. So the initial adaptation may have been more simply inherited than we would see by crossing these much more widely divergent species uh, in modern times. So there are a few cases where people have gone and cloned the genes controlling natural uh, morphological differences between plant species. So here's one from Senecio. It's a wonderful example. It's from Rico Cohen's lab in the UK. Um, this is actually a species that arose by a hybridization event. There's a British species, which is not very beautiful. Uh, here it has no ray flowers. And then there's this beautiful Italian species. Of course, the British were very jealous. And so they imported the Italian species into England and grew it in their gardens, where it crossed with their own native species. And through a process of hybridization and introgression, then the trait of ray flowers was transferred in to create a new species in England that has all of the vegetative and uh, appearance of the British species, but has this one trait, the presence of ray flowers from the Italian species. It's controlled by a single genus or single uh, gene, and it's a DNA binding transcription factor. So same kind of gene we saw over and over again with domestication. And then here's a final case I just learned about this morning, although if I'd been up on the literature, I would have known about this uh, before. Uh, this is from the Lima's lab. Uh, it's a wonderful example. And where could it be better from? The Galapagos Islands, right? So this is two species of selenum with very different leaf shapes, one with a, 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 a leaf that is highly compound, another one with a little less highly compound. What's the inheritance? Essentially a single gene controls that trait as a semi-dominant allele. Uh, 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 Dr. Kimura in her lab has cloned the gene and found that in this gene, a single base pair change, cis-regulatory change, is responsible for the difference in phenotype. The gene is not a DNA binding transcription factor. It's a descendant of a DNA binding transcription factor. It has 
it's a chunk of the gene, but it's lacking the DNA binding site. So it's probably interacting, actually they know, it's interacting with other members uh, involved in regulating transcription, although it itself is unlikely to bind DNA because it's missing the DNA binding uh, domain of the protein. So this is very similar to what we see with domestication again, and it's an example of, an, of a naturally occurring variant on the Galapagos Islands. <clears throat> So, you know, for my money, what we have learned from domestication seems very similar to what we've learned in um, natural species. The two cases from uh, Nalima's lab and from Rico Cohen's lab, two developmental biologists, um, have uh, shown ver stuff very similar to what the agronomists have shown working with uh, crop species. So, what, you know, what's the, why is there discomfort? And there is a lot of discomfort out there. Uh, to equate domestication with evolution. And I think it's the same discomfort that Darwin felt. You know, this idea that there's a designer, and you don't want to think about a designer designing natural species, and so it sort of opens up a very uncomfortable uh, feeling to think that humans as designers, uh, if we allow that to be the analogy, maybe we're you know, opening the door to um, something uh, that uh, is different from what occurs in nature. But I like to think about it this way. I think we can think um, two ways about this. And this is the way I think the, the, that uh, Wallace and other critics of using um, domestication as a model, here's what I, essentially what I think they're saying. There's, when Wallace and other people who say you can't use domestication, they're saying humans are special. You know, we are apart from nature. We are not a part of nature. And so the things that we do uh, uh, cannot be counted as part of nature that when we evolved consciousness, we removed ourselves from nature, and so therefore we're a different set of rules than what goes on in nature, and so we cannot use uh, domestication as an example of evolution. It's not evolution. Uh, do not use the word evolution in your publications if you're working on corn domestication. Um, <clears throat> but here's the way I like to think about it, is that evolution is really a collection of special cases and there's the special case of viruses that evolve, a special case of haploid, non-sexual organisms, like bacteria which evolve. They don't really have species in the same sense of diploid sexual species. Um, you have the special case of things like angiosperms, which are reliant on other organisms like birds to disperse their seeds. And then you have a special case like uh, corn and crops, which are reliant on another product of evolution, humans and human consciousness, for uh, their seed dispersal. So I just see crops, uh, I see us as part of nature, and I see crops as one of the many special cases of what uh, goes on in evolution. And so uh, for my case, I'm uh, very comfortable using the word evolution to describe what myself and others uh, working with crops are studying. And I'm going to end with one um, final uh, slide. And so this is the, I'm going to show you the results of a survey given from a colleague of mine to undergraduate biological science majors at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the Berkeley of the Midwest, okay? We are bastion of liberal thinking in the Midwest, okay? So he asked students in the uh, undergrad, un, biological science majors, mind you, how would you summarize your views on the truth of evolution as contrasted with, for example, creationism? Do you believe that evolution happened, as scientists say? Do you tend to believe it, but you need to know more? Uh, you suspect that it didn't happen, but you're willing to listen? Or I believe that evolution did not happen, as scientists claim, and I do not expect to have my mind changed. So how would you think? You know, no one's going to take this, right? These are undergraduate biological science majors at UW-Madison. So it's not huge, but 6% of our undergraduate biological sciences majors do not believe in evolution, and there's nothing you're going to tell them that's going to change their mind. Another 21% don't believe it, but they're willing to listen. And so that's about 27% of our biological science majors at UW-Madison who really don't believe in evolution. And then 56, only 56% believe it, but they still feel they need to know more, they're not quite certain, and they're only 18% who are true believers in evolution as scientists explain to them. So uh, David Baum, my colleague who did this, he did it with UW students, 
And then we have a summer program where we bring biological science majors from colleges largely from the Bible Belt, from, well, we call it that, uh, down south, <coughs> uh, who you might expect to have a different view um, from us. And so he gives them the same survey, and here's what he gets with them. So 18% don't believe, and nothing you can say is going to change their mind. 7% uh, uh, don't believe, but they're willing to listen. 31%, uh, you know, I think it's true, but they'd like to know more. More of them actually believe exactly as 44%. One of the things I noticed is, you know, the Midwesterners, you know, don't like to have strong opinions even about the weather. You know, they're kind of they're kind of clustered in the middle. You know, where these these kids from the South, you know, from Texas and places, they know for darn sure what it is they believe, and so they they have more of a bimodal distribution. You know, 44% down down 18% at the other extreme. Um, so, I mean, just, you know, I wanted to summarize to say, I think domestication is actually a really nice example we could use for teaching evolution to students. You know, we have the organisms, we can show them the wild form, we can show them the cultivated form, and we've got lots of nice molecular examples now where we can explain to them uh, uh, how things actually have changed. And so I think, uh, you know, we should keep domestication as an example of what happens in evolution. We should consider ourselves part of nature and not something aside from nature and uh, maybe use some of these in uh, the teaching that we do. So thank you very much. Um, uh, so, so the QTL and the, the domesticated by wild crosses or the QTL and the wild by wild crosses? I mean... Well, I, I'm just saying, so <clears> you've got, let's say you grow tomatoes. And right. You look at, at fruit size. You yeah. can grow them under fairly controlled conditions. Whereas I come from more ecological background. I'm right. talking about the G by E. And so right. So these kinds of, <clears throat> this phenotypic expression, is it pretty volatile? Or is it, is it general? It's pretty stable. It's sort of a main effect of... I think one thing that, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question, but let me say this. And, um, I think the breeding process has probably selected for less G by E, right? So that you want stability, right? So you're, you're and I think that's what happens with our branching example in corn, is that teosinte in one environment will not branch at all. If it's heavily shaded by surrounding plants, it doesn't branch much, it'll go straight up. If it's out in the middle of a field, it branches profusely. What corn has done is they select to eliminate that possibility, and under any circumstance, it's going to branch, or not branch. And so I think uh, a lot of what is selected for is stability, you know, that you're going to do the same thing under any environmental condition. I think so. Yeah, I think that's pretty, that, I mean, plant, wild plants need to be more plastic, because they know less about where they're going to be, where the seed's going to land. Domesticated plant, you know, it knows it's going to be well taken care of, and um, so therefore, it can change its strategy to, you know, the best um, strategy for the environment it can, you know, reliably end up in. Because you're still decreasing the reliability of the environment. I think so, yeah. You're eliminating competition. You're going to clear the field. So you don't need to worry about responding to competition very much. Yeah, so, so, I, so the, you, he pointed out several examples where you said, well, there must be a result of selection. So there must be a mechanism of inheritance, right. whatever that is. Yeah, so I, I, Paul's pointing out that you know, breeders working with 
breeding stocks year after year after year and seeing the changes and seeing that they were heritable from parent to offspring, uh, even though they didn't understand the mechanism of, heritable, uh, you know, of inheritance, they knew these traits were heritable. And so part of Darwin's interest in uh, breeders and bre the works of breeders was because that was a useful way of demonstrating that variation was stably inherited. You know, could arise anew and be stably inherited. Yeah. I, if I'm summarizing what you said, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, domestication is something that happened 10,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago. Right. And uh, crop evolution has continued after that. Yes. Uh, all of your examples deal with uh, evolutionary changes occurring at the time of domestication. If you were to look for evolutionary changes after domestication, what would you look for? Um, so, I mean, you can, so a lot of things happen after domestication. Like, one of the things is diversification. Um, so crops become adapted to different environments. And you know, I can show you great slides of corn adapted to the deserts of New Mexico, adapted to the highland tropical forest of Mexico and stuff like that. And a lot of that's probably uh, just driven by natural selection, um, where you know, what we'd call natural, you know, that the breeder is not actively trying to change it to be better in the, in the uh, desert or better um, in the tropical forest. And, and so you can see changes in morphology and water uh, usage and stuff like that, that enabled crops to diversify and adapt to different uh, environments. You know, but now, of course, what goes on in uh, modern plant breeding, you know, after Mendel, you know, things changed because, um, you know, people now knew the inher basis of inheritance and, you know, what do you call that stuff? You know, and I, is that still within the realm of evolution, you know, if, if somebody's making hybrid crops. And, you know, to me, it's kind of a philosophical question. It depends on how you think we are as a species. Are we part of nature, right? And, and uh, or are we something different? So, you know, I, yeah. The, the diversification is always connected with long time span. My question is to the future. So we have, let's say, a couple of handful of, of uh, plant species which are really, really heavy duty domestic. This sort of bomb, or is there any effort right now where now with the new knowledge we have, people pick a few wild plants and really go wild in you know, large numbers, and give a classic selection, give a genesis, and so on, and attempt to produce, let's say, a new, pro a new, new crop in 50 years? Yeah, so there, of course, are people trying to produce new crops, um, but we have so much invested, you know, in, you can take a crop like corn. You know, it is, we've so heavily invested in that technologically. Uh, everything from food processing, you know, on down to uh, breeding and uh, the way uh, tractors are made and everything else, um, that there's so much invested in that to start over from scratch with something new and make a profit would be very difficult because we're driven by, right, it's the profit motive. Uh, you, could, you could start a plant breeding company and pick some wild grass and decide, okay, I'm gonna do it again. Uh, and then, you know, apply for some venture capital money and see where you get. Um, but, um, so I think that it's, it would be a hard hill to climb. The, there are people, I know Steve Tanksley has suggested, now that we know some of the genes involved in domestication, uh, let's go out to the deserts and find desert plants and we'll insert into them these domestication genes and we'll make new desert adapted crops. And my response is, why destroy the deserts? You know, it's like, the, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's not gonna do any good in the long run. We'll just grow more people, we'll destroy more of the environment. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I'd rather try to, you know, let's make the system work the way it is now rather than, you know, move into you know, taking over more of the earth. So that's my own approach. But anyway, there are people thinking in those in those ways, and some, like there's a, the Land Institute in uh, Kansas is doing this type of thing. They wanna get perennial crops. You know, I don't think it'll work, but that's my opinion. Why? Uh, well, they want perennial cereals, and like all our cereals are annuals. And you know, if, you, where do you, if you're a cereal, what do you want? You want grain. You don't wanna be investing in making underground perenniating structures that's taking away from your grain yield. So you'd have to have a lot of benefit for doing that. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It just. Yeah. I mean, if all of, if everybody else around the world is is going to annuals for grain crops, you know, there must be a reason. I would. You know, and rice is one example where you had a very closely related wild perennial, and you know that didn't get drawn into domestication. 
And so they're, you know, so I don't know. I, I think it's unlikely. You know, and then the other problem with, you know, uh, pests tend to build up in perennial crops over years. So it may have, I know like with corn, we have, in our cornfields, we have to rotate them because of the types of pests that would build up in our fields. I, maybe farmers put the pesticides down, we don't do that, but um, so we put in you know, alfalfa for two years and then we go back to corn. And we need two years after, without corn before we can go back to putting corn to feel that we're not gonna get a uh, rootworm. Yeah, I just, you know, so there are different thoughts about it. In some cases, I think the artificial selection during domestication wasn't really all that intense. I mean, there, there are just papers in science over the last, I think one quite recently, showing that it took, you know, several thousand years to fix the non-shattering trait in rice. You know, that went from the time it first appears to the time it, dis, you know, the shattering phenotype disappears is thousands of years. Uh, so, as the, I, you know, I don't know. And so I do, maybe do we know as much, like there are cases like the stickleback fishes where you have a nice geological record and you can see things that happen pretty fast there. So is that any uh, weaker? So to me, I, you know, I don't think you could make the case that it's always strong in, in domestication or artificial selection. It's always weak in natural selection. You could say there's probably a distribution and whether those two distributions are different from one another uh, is an open question. And you know, does it really matter? You know, and I think you could, you know, you could probably define 10 different types of natural selections for different organisms, say for diploids, haploids, sexual, non-sexual, plant, animal, vertebrate, invertebrate, and for each of these different categories, you could find something different. And um, so, you know, if, to me, what you wanna get to is, what's the thing that's in common for, you know, if you wanna get the basic principles, what's in common across all of that? Well, it's not a, yeah, it wasn't an editor, it was, uh, it was a, a reviewer. And it's happened twice, and probably from not the same reviewer, because it happened once to me and it's happened to this colleague. Um, and I've actually had a, a member of the evolutionary biology community who actually just directly asked me that. Um, he said, well, why do you use the word evolution to describe what you're doing? And um, <clears throat> they're professors of evolutionary biology, and that for them, <laughs> You know, humans are something special apart from nature. And so what humans do doesn't fit. And, uh, you know, for me, you know, if I look, if you look in the journal Evolution, almost everything that's done is on diploid sexual organisms. And, you know, probably if we knew the number of species of haploid bacteria, bacteria, it's probably far greater. Although what's a species in bacteria anyway, right? So, <clears throat> I don't know, I just think we have a very, you know, there are people who have a narrow view. And, you know, I, I, of course, I work on a crop, so I have like a more, a big tent view of evolution, so. Oh, you, you see that with the Arabidopsis versus cultivated crops, that there's some things that people think um, can be defined in cultivated crops that are different in Arabidopsis and vice versa. And uh, as we get more information, we see that indeed there are overlapping stories. Yeah. So in, for our, the two genes we've studied in, in my um, lab, <clears throat> there is uh, the TB1, there's this enhancer. All maize is identical for that. We surveyed, I can't say we surveyed all maize, but what we did is we did um, you know, a single 96 well plate, 95 different types of maize from throughout the Americas, and they were all identical and all different from Teosinte. And for our other gene, the, the the TGA, which controls this fruit case, we did the same thing. A single plate, 96 um, 
or 95 individuals, and all maize has the one amino acid in that sample and all teosinte another amino acid. So, um, you know, I think they're going to be fixed. Yeah, for maize, there's, I think it's pretty clear that there, it's complicated though. So there was probably a single domestication in some sense, but corn and teosinte are cross uh, compatible. So there's got to have been a lot of gene flow between them uh, over the years too. So for maybe some of the genes fixed early on, we'll find single alleles were fixed, but for maybe for genes that were fixed later, there would be multiple different alleles in maize. 